Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the True Scary Stories Creepy Fox Podcast with your host, the one and only, the Creepy Fox. Tonight, join me for some awesome uh, True Scary Stories that were sent in to me by subscribers like yourselves that are sure to give you a chill. From a creepy encounter at the side of the road to a robbery at a grocery store, these stories are sure to get your heart running. So make sure to sit back, relax, grab yourself some snacks, and let's begin. Cabin Fever This happened toward the end of 2010, when my uncle let me borrow his cabin that's about 20 minutes away from Palmer, Alaska. I've been looking forward to this getaway for quite some time, since school was especially difficult that spring semester. It didn't help that I took six classes, three of them being upper-level courses. I could complain about how much writing I had to do, but then again, what would you call this? At any rate, I had first pulled up to the cabin, which mind you, is private property. I was able to see some footprints in the dirt. Now, I did grow a bit weary, but when I called my uncle to ask whether or not he had been here, he told me he was just there a few days ago doing some remodeling in the kitchen area, which I could visually see myself. That's why I didn't further question him about the footprints. Fast forward a few nights that I got in there, and I was just walking out of the restroom and happened to pass by the living room. I noticed that the automatic porch light had come on, indicating it had detected some sort of movement. I raced over to the window, and I could see a large figure walking around the property, just out of the light's reach. One thing was evident by my sudden discovery. It was no bear or any other wild animal as this figure was clearly the size of an average adult male. So I went ahead and opened the window to try and get a better look, but instead, I watched as the figure scurried and grew distant until I could no longer see them. After a few minutes, I sat on the couch, and I started contemplating for about 15 minutes whether or not I should go out there and scan the property. I eventually did, but I couldn't find anyone. What I did find, however, were footprint tracks that led me to a part of my uncle's fencing. This must have been where the person got in. But why? Why was my uncle's cabin and property so special and important that whoever came here had to make their way in by force? Either way, I returned back to the cabin and I called up my uncle, and he told me he didn't know anyone who would be trespassing on his property, especially without permission. I mean, just think about it realistically. I'm out here, in the middle of nowhere. My uncle told me he could come over to keep me company, but I told him it's all good and that I'm armed. Well, fast forward to maybe about 4am and I couldn't shake off this weird noise. It sounded like something moving. I thought it was a dream, until the loud bang that came from somewhere in the cabin woke me out of my slumber. I shot straight up, and I immediately grabbed my shotgun that laid next to my nightstand, fearing a hungry bear had just broken in. As soon as I reached the doorway in my room, I happened to see a large figure, similar to the one from hours prior. I watched this figure walk into one of the guest bedrooms. This was no bear. Adrenaline is pumping through my veins and I'm sweating bullets as my hands are shaking and my breath skyrocketed out of control. Just a few feet from the guest bedroom, the intruder ended up walking out into the hallway holding a large machete in one hand and a bag in the other. As they were wearing a balaclava, I didn't know who they might have been. So, I jumped back, and then I shouted at this intruder to drop the machete and not make any sort of sudden movements, or I would fire. They not only dropped the machete, but the bag and a bunch of my uncle's expensive tools from the garage fall over the hallway. I, I didn't know anyone was in here. Please, uh, I don't mean any harm, he said, shaking. Still, something about what he said didn't seem genuine. It's like he was waiting for me to drop my guard in order to grab the machete again and come at me. Luckily, the shotgun never left my side. I escorted the man out of the cabin and then told him to never come around here again, or next time, I wasn't going to be so kind. I then watched and waited until I could no longer visually see him, and then I proceeded to check the damage. The window in the guest bedroom 
was completely smashed with a brick lying flat on its side next to a dresser. That's how this man got in. Well, I didn't sleep the rest of that evening. I stayed awake sitting on the couch, drinking about three cups of coffee until my uncle arrived 30 minutes later. As of this day, we still don't know who that man was or why he tried robbing my uncle's cabin. Maybe he didn't see a vehicle. He assumed the place was empty. After all, I had my vehicle parked inside the garage and thus no visual confirmation. Talk about being determined. I mean, just think about it. Breaking and entering onto private property that's in the middle of the forest? What did he expect? A warm welcome? I'm not sure. But I do believe had it not been for the shotgun, I may have never gotten out of that cabin in one piece. I'm almost certain of it. A word of advice. Don't break into areas you shouldn't. Because unlike me, the owner or the owners may not let you off with a warning. Double date at the ice skating rink. This was earlier this year, right before everyone was forced to hunker down in their homes. Which by the way, I hope you're all staying safe. My girlfriend Brittany and I were going to a local ice skating rink where we would be going on a double date with a couple of my co-workers. This was the first time Brittany was going to meet them and they absolutely loved her. So much so that Trish, the girl co-worker, and Brittany have more or less become like long-lost sisters. Anyways, the four of us in total met in the lobby and then we proceeded to ice skate for roughly about an hour. Once we were done, Josh, the male co-worker, and I head toward the cafeteria so that we could order a pizza for all of us to share. Both ladies were sitting in the lobby, just talking and relaxing. Fast forward about 20 minutes of waiting and our pizza is finally ready. I went ahead and grabbed some extra plates as Josh held onto the pizza box. As we make our way back to our ladies, we see a couple of guys, no older than us, we are in our late 20s, talking with our girlfriends. Not really an issue since we both trust them, but when one of the men grabs my girlfriend's arm and then pulls her closer, I all about lose it. I drop the paper plates and then I book it over to my girlfriend, like a lion looking out for the lioness. Excuse me, but that's my girlfriend. Is there a problem here? I shout at the top of my lungs as the guy pushes my girlfriend back and then focuses his attention toward me. And who are you supposed to be? The boyfriend? What a joke. Your girl's better off with me there, buddy. Both of them start to laugh and I'm beginning to fume. However, I didn't want to cause a scene, which is why Brittany and Trish walk over to Josh and I tell these guys to get lost. That would have been the hope. Instead, the guy who initiated this encounter, who from what I can smell has had one too many drinks, puts his hand into his oversized jacket, and then seconds later, he's taking out a little switch knife. My eyes went wide, and that fight or flight response kicks in. That response is very difficult for me to paint a picture of. I hate to say it, but unless you're in a situation where you genuinely feel like you're in danger, you can't really put it into words. The guy comes at me with the knife as his partner in crime cheers him on like some sort of cheerleader. I immediately put my arm up, which allowed me to block him from reaching my face. He did manage to give my arm a decent scrape, nothing too serious or deep, it just stung. But using my training in self-defense, which I guess I should have mentioned prior but now you know. I managed to quickly disarm him. His partner, although not armed, tries to back up his friend, but here's when Josh and a couple of the other ice skating patrons come to my rescue. Together we manage to subdue the two and the girls go to get a couple of the security guards. Police and EMTs did arrive a short time later and the EMTs quickly patch me up and as for the two creeps who were giving us a hard time, they were soon placed into handcuffs and taken away. We can only assume they were drunk since they were given a breathalyzer test, plus the way they were acting wasn't exactly normal. Anyways, that's my story. Edit. The pizza got cold, but luckily we were given a new one for free. A very angry customer. 
This is a chilling story of mine that happened in February of 2017. Since I still work there, I don't want to give too many details. For privacy reasons, of course. However, I will tell you I work at an organic grocery store. And as I mentioned, I still do. But now I'm an assistant manager. Anyways, it was an evening shift and I just left the break room after my first break. The store was particularly busy since it was a Friday evening, and most families are out here doing their shopping. I was busy stocking the apples, when an older lady came up to me, asking if I could assist her with putting a couple of the watermelons into her cart. I gladly agreed, and dropped what I was doing to help her. It's in these moments I began to hear someone arguing and cursing. It does happen from times, but it's usually something like a misunderstanding. The woman thanks me, but just a second later she points over to one of the aisles. Here's where I see one of my co-workers, who for the sake of the story we're going to call Maria. Maria appears to be dealing with a customer, that who from just one look at his face, is mad about something. The guy, mid-forties, wearing a khaki-colored trench coat with dark boots and a hat, begins pushing at Maria. Something snapped in me, and I rushed over to her rescue, since for whatever reason, Nobody was even bothering to intervene. All of a sudden, when I got there, the man started yelling at me, and he said something along the lines of, Why is it that every time I come into the store, you guys never have what I'm looking for? I take one look at Maria, and I tell her to get the manager, as I do my best to de-escalate the situation. I give him the usual spiel that we're trained to say, but this doesn't seem to work. He starts to grow even more angry, and even starts to push me. Naturally, I'm pretty scared, as this guy outweighed me by an estimated 100 pounds, and was about 6 foot 3. For example, I'm 5 foot 11, 170 pounds. Pretty scrawny, to be honest. I was doing all I could not to fight back, which is why I tell him he needs to leave, or we would be calling the cops. That seemed to have worked as he starts to walk away, but then all of a sudden he comes charging at me. Those next moments seem to have gone in slow motion, as I see him charging down the aisle. But I, in one quick motion, jump to my rear, and the man falls and tumbles into a display of cookies. Finally, a customer comes over to my rescue and gets the guy into a sort of wrestling hold. My manager and a couple more co-workers arrive, and even more customers are coming to assist. Well, it turned out that the man who came to help me was an off-duty police officer who had just entered the store when he saw the commotion. I am very thankful for him showing up when he did, because the guy who originally caused all this badness had a knife on him. Well, maybe that's an overstatement. He had one of those little multi-purpose tools that did have a little blade. That's what I mean by him having a knife. I don't think his intentions were to ever use it, as he never made any motions to take it out. It was just something he was carrying alongside his wallet and his phone. But I guess we'll never truly know. In any case, I did press charges, but that was pretty much all there was to the story. Like I said, I'm still working here, and although we'll sometimes get rowdy customers, nothing comes as close to something as scary as that incident. Grocery Store Hold Up I discovered your channel a few weeks ago after I was wondering what my daughter had been listening to every single night. Now you have me hooked too and we look forward to each of your new episodes. Since we're both fans, I finally sat down to write out my very own scary experience that I had from when I was in my late teens. This is from the 1980s, and it takes place in a small town in middle America. Times were very different back then. People were a lot more sociable and trusting of one another. All the kids on the block would be out playing until at least 9 or 10 p.m., and as for the teenagers and adults, they were working. I found myself working at a family-owned grocery store for a couple of summers. I would alternate with my co-workers, either checking out customers at the register, stocking shelves, or assisting said customers with taking groceries to their vehicles. Now, although rude guests were far in between, averaging maybe one angry customer every other month, there was one individual in particular that made someone complaining about a lack of sweets the least of our concerns. It was in the early hours, approximately 8 or 9 a.m. I was working with two other co-workers in the store just about three or four customers. 
I found myself stocking our shelves with the shipments of bread and bagels, when one of the guests ended up walking over to me and asked if I could help her with filling up her five-gallon water bottle. That was something our store provided, as many people in town didn't have water delivered to their homes, unlike today, where most families have such services set up. So, the woman pays at the register, and then we ended up walking over to her vehicle, picking up the empty five-gallon bottle. Then we went over to the water dispenser. After that, I take it back to her vehicle, and she soon leaves with a smile across her face. Nice. Well, maybe not so nice after what happens next. As I made my short walk back to the front of the grocery store, there's a guy wearing a trench coat that's pacing back and forth. I normally won't pay attention to any details like this, but something in me was telling me that this guy was definitely up to something. I don't know why I felt that way, but in order to confirm my feelings, I went up to the man and asked him if he needed any assistance. He stopped pacing and then just stared right into my eyes like he was lost in some sort of thought. I said, Did you need help with anything, sir? No, I'm good. I'm just thinking, that's all. Satisfied, yet still a bit worried, I returned back to my duties, but not before getting on the phone and calling the local police station. I explained that there's this really weird guy outside her store, and something seems to be wrong with him. Yes, it might seem like I was overreacting over nothing, and normally you might be right. But considering my co-workers had grown a bit weary too, we decided the concern was genuine. Over the course of the next five to seven minutes, we're returning to our duties, but not without keeping a lookout for the strange individual. We did lose sight of him for a few moments, and we assumed he had finally left. This was just for a moment. As I walked over to the front of the store in order to begin mopping, the strange man in the trench coat reappears from the side of the front window and then walks into the store. He stands at the entrance for about 10 seconds fiddling around with something in one of his pockets before he shouts and says, Nobody move. The man reveals a revolver and an audible gasp is heard throughout the building. Here I am just a few feet to his right, all the while I'm doing all I can not to lose it and scream. The man then tells my two co-workers at the cash register to begin putting money into grocery bags. Mind you, he did look over at me, but I think since he saw how frozen I was, he wasn't too concerned. Time seemed to go into slow motion, and I thought of something that I truly believe may have been our lifesaver. I was holding on to a heavy-duty mop, one whack over the head and he's toast. But then again, if it wasn't effective, that could have been another nightmare. I didn't think about what I did next. It sort of just happened naturally. Instead of going for the head, however, like I originally thought, I used the mop and its momentum to smack the revolver out of this man's grasp. Thank goodness this guy's reflexes were slow as a turtle, because he didn't even run over to the revolver, which had slid over to one of the cash registers. That co-worker who's standing there manages to grab it, and the man clearly disarmed and with this angry 19-year-old girl holding a mop, books it out of the front door, running across the street. In that moment, two policemen are walking in, and when they see I've got a mop, I tell them that man just tried to rob our store. The two officers then run after this man, and they manage to get him in less than 20 seconds. As this is happening, my co-worker calls me over and shows me that the revolver is empty. One look, and indeed she's correct. Anyways, I feel like this is getting to be way longer than I wanted it to be, so I'll just go ahead and bring everything to a close. The man was rightfully arrested with attempted robbery, and the owners of the store decided to hire a security guard, which really went a long way to deter any sort of bad guys. I gained a brand new title after that incident, Superwoman, for being so brave and saving everyone from what could have potentially have been worse. Edit. Yes, I do realize the revolver was empty, but in those moments we had to assume it wasn't. Sneaking around my backyard. This was during the summer of 2012, when our house was being remodeled. We were repainting, changing carpets, and adding an extension to the garage. By the way, it's just myself, my wife, and our two cats, Tom and Kennedy. For about a month, the construction workers we hired would arrive around 7am, and then work until 5pm, where the rest of the evening was just us. Well, one night at around 11 p.m. on the worker's day off, I'd awoken because I needed to use the restroom. 
My wife and our two cats slept peacefully in the bedroom as the air conditioning sounded off in the background. After I was done, I couldn't go back to sleep. Try as I did, I rolled back and forth thinking about the next day at work. Frustrated, I got up and went into the kitchen to warm up some milk and grab a couple of peanut butter cookies my wife had made earlier in the evening. My favorite, by the way. While I stood next to the countertop, dreading all the paperwork I would have to fill out at the office, I looked outside through the window and saw the beautiful full moon as it shined upon my glasses. Grabbing my attention, I exit the kitchen and step into my backyard so I could get a better look. It was a warm yet comfortable 80 degrees with a light wind beginning to pick up. As if the night couldn't have gotten better, my attention was suddenly laser focused to a noise I heard by the garage. As there was still remodeling being done, I thought that the wind may have pushed over a bucket of paint or maybe even some wood. But the more I listened, the more I could determine what I was hearing was instead the sound of something living. I make the short walk down this little outdoor walkway, and when I reach the back of the garage, I happen to see a lighter being switched on. There, sitting next to a pile of wood planks, appears to be a homeless man. I'm sorry, but you do know you're trespassing. I think you need to leave there, pal. They didn't listen to me. Instead, I watched as this disheveled man placed the lighter next to a glass pipe and I could see smoke rise. It looks like I was dealing with a junkie. Okay, that's it. You need to leave right now, or I'm calling the cops. That phrase worked wonders. The man lowers the lighter and pipe, throws them into his backpack, then gets up and just stands there. Now, I'm a pretty hefty dude. I'm 6 foot, 250 pounds, and this guy is a scrawny 5 foot 11 or so between 150 to 160 pounds. If by any means I had to kick him out by force, I would have no issue doing so. However, what he did in the next moments brought chills down my spine. He grabs his backpack he had lying next to him, and then I kid you not, he's got a hold of a knife moments later. My immediate reaction was to reach for a metal pipe that was placed on the wall beside me, and this was when I tell him that if he comes any closer, I wouldn't be afraid to knock him out. Thank the heavens it never came to violence. Instead, the guy just looks at me funny, before putting the knife away, and then walking past me. I followed him until he hopped over my fence and then disappeared into the night. I still called the cops anyways, and when they arrived, they searched my entire neighborhood. They never did find him, which was a shame, but on the bright side, he never did show up again. It's been over eight years since that incident, and whenever I look at the full moon, I'll have myself a good laugh, even though when it first happened, it was no laughing matter. Fake Trainer To this very day, this has to be one of the more creepier experiences I have ever gone through. I hope that it acts as a reminder of being careful with where you share your information. You never know who might be listening. By the way, I'm now 40 years old, but when this occurred I was 28, Now I just moved out of my parents' house. One afternoon I had returned from work and I went into the kitchen to reward myself with a couple of cinnamon pop tarts. As I sat at the kitchen table looking at my phone, I got a call from an unknown number. For some context, earlier that morning before I went to work, I'd gone to 24-hour fitness because I was looking at getting a personal trainer. I did sign up, but unfortunately the trainer I was supposed to work with wasn't there. Therefore, I left my information, as well as my phone number, with the receptionist. I assumed it was the trainer getting back to me in order to discuss the training regiment. Hello, this is Amelia speaking. I answered in a friendly tone. Uh, yeah, I'm calling because you were asking about getting a personal trainer. This is him. Jonathan? It's really nice to meet you. I got a smile across my face as I then began telling him about my goals and aspirations. We talked for about three minutes, when all of a sudden the conversation went to asking me about my home address as well as my full name. I was assuming this was to confirm I was who I claimed to be, therefore I didn't question whether or not this was the standard when it came to signing up for a membership. I gave him my information, but when discussing the price, he ended up hanging up the phone, and all went silent. Thinking there was a loss of connection, I redial, but it sends me straight to voicemail. Well, that was strange. I tried a couple of more times, but to no avail. Fast forward 20 minutes later, and my cell phone starts to ring. This time, the caller ID says it's from 24-hour fitness. Quite a turn from just a bit ago, when all that showed on my home screen was a phone number. 
So I answered, and it's the same receptionist I'd spoken to earlier. I asked her about Jonathan the trainer calling me, and she says that he actually just walked in and asked if I wanted to speak to him. I agreed, and moments later, I'm speaking with Jonathan. Jonathan, what happened? Did your phone run out of battery or something? Jonathan the trainer was confused, but so was I. The voice that came through the phone sounded nothing like the Jonathan I'd spoken to just a short time ago. The previous Jonathan's voice was a lot more raspy and older. Are you sure I didn't speak to you earlier, Jonathan? You aren't pulling a prank on me, are you? He reassures me he wasn't and that's when all of a sudden my body goes cold. Who did I speak to? How did they get my number? And what was I to do now that they had my home address and full name? Well, once I was done speaking to this real Jonathan, I went to my local police station where I filed a police report. Unfortunately, there wasn't much else they could do other than tell me to call my bank and credit union so they could put a watch on my account. I was more worried that someone may try to impersonate me and then attempt opening bank accounts or credit cards under my name. After all, that's a very real thing that criminals will dedicate their careers to. In the meantime, the trail for this mysterious caller went silent for about a week. One evening, it's just me and my best friend Carol who had spent the night over at my house and were both fast asleep. All of a sudden, the house alarm sounded off and Carol and I jumped out of our respective beds. My immediate reaction was to grab the pistol I keep in the nightstand and then lock the bedroom door and hunker down. I knew that police would be getting here in a matter of moments as any time the alarm sounds, it sends notifications to send police. Meanwhile, this is happening. We are able to hear footsteps walking down the hallway. Carol and I are just sitting there in the corner, freaking out and trying to remain as perfectly quiet and still as possible. When the footsteps reach the bedroom door, we let out an audible gasp, as soon the doorknob began to jingle. We're pretty much fighting back tears and I'm fearing I may have to fire at this home intruder, but just then we can hear police sirens. A sense of relief comes over Carol and I, as the home intruder suddenly runs, and the footsteps go quiet. Drop the knife. Get on the ground. We can hear police officers shout from just outside the bedroom wall. We take a look through the window, and officers are in the process of putting someone in handcuffs. Now in case you're wondering why we didn't escape from the window, it's because there are metal bars installed on them. That's the way they came when my parents helped me get the place, by the way. Anyways, once the situation was under control, we started speaking to the officers and provided them with context on what had taken place. To save you on what could potentially be another 10 minutes of information and context, I'm just going to go ahead and jump to the conclusion, since I'm getting kind of lazy here. Who broke into my house wasn't a home burglar, but instead a stalker who had overheard my conversation with the receptionist at the gym. Yes, that same very day where I gave her my name and phone number. He confessed he had been sitting at one of the tables that's next to the front desk and actually listened in and wrote down my details. His plan was to take me with him to a faraway cabin he had rented in the mountains. Yeah, no kidding. Thankfully, he was locked up and I've never seen or heard from him since then, as I now live across the country, and I've even legally changed my name. I was recording, then a burglar broke in. As someone who has a passion for audio recording, I really appreciate all the work you put in for your subscribers and fans. You and many other incredible video creators are the reason why I'm currently majoring in radio and TV film. My dad has helped me invest and build my own personal recording studio that has everything you would expect. Soundproof walls, a mini refrigerator filled with plenty of water bottles for those nights I'm recording for hours on end, a TV with my own video game consoles, a desk with my Mac computer, and a couch that turns into a bed. This recording slash room was built using one of the extra rooms that was originally for storage. Anyways, now that you have a basic idea of what I do, I want to take you back to October of last year, when I was busy recording a podcast for one of my radio and TV film classes. It was approximately 3pm and my parents wouldn't be getting home until the earliest 5pm. I do have a younger sister, but she was hanging out with her friends as it was a Friday and that is their tradition. I mention these details because normally no one will bother me as I have a little light outside the room that'll turn on and off anytime I'm working. If my parents needed anything or my sister, they would call me on the phone and I would pause my recording. 
At any rate, there I was working, when all of a sudden I saw the bedroom door crack open just a hair, through the reflection of the computer monitor. I turned around, taking off my headphones, and to my surprise, there's somebody in a ski mask, holding a pocket knife. I got the chills, as my immediate reaction was to reach into my drawer and grab the revolver I keep in there at all times. Many people always called me paranoid for having one, but I got the last laugh during this break-in. Thank goodness that this home burglar can't even make it within five feet of me, because when I brandish the revolver, I see through the ski mask their eyes open ever so wider. Without saying anything, they immediately run out the door, and I chase after him, adrenaline pumping and all. He leads me to one of the windows in the living room, which had the screen removed, and I watched as he jumps into a waiting white van that's parked in the driveway. It then backs up and disappears down the block. You bet I called the police and they showed up within five minutes where they proceeded to do a search of the immediate area. Now I hate to end on such an anticlimactic note, but unfortunately they never did catch that home intruder, nor the getaway driver. Oh and if you're wondering how they got in, my sister left the window open before she left with her friends. I was pretty upset with her, and so were my parents. With that said, no one should ever have to worry about having anyone enter their most precious and safest place imaginable, that being their very own home. As an update, we have installed home cameras and we even just got a home security system. Nothing scary as of late, but if anything else happens, I'll be sure to let you all know. Thanks for listening. Late Night Outing Nightmare This was just a couple of years ago. I had gotten off of work from Target and I happened to have noticed I had a missed call from my best friend Jason. He also texted me asking if I could speak. So I give him a call and Jason answers me almost instantly. Hey bro, you won't believe it, but Amy and I, we broke up and it wasn't pretty. Oh man, seriously, what happened? You good man? As it so happened, his girlfriend of five years was cheating on him which was very devastating as he trusted her 100%. Hey man, forget about her. I just got off of work, but if you give me an hour, I'll come pick you up and we can grab some dinner and we can go bowling. I'd like that. Thanks. So I got to my apartment, feed my cat, shower, and then drive 15 minutes to go pick up Jason. He was pretty sad. Poor guy. We went to a Red Robin to pick up a couple of hamburgers and french fries. It must have sat there for almost two hours. Once we were done, we went bowling, just like I had mentioned. It seemed that Jason I knew, the fun and outgoing one, was slowly starting to reblossom. Fast forward to about 10pm, and we're driving around town just listening to music, when we got the idea of heading to in and out to pick up a couple of strawberry shakes. From there, we drove up into the fancier part of town, where there's a park that overlooks the entire city. You were able to see for miles on end, and with nothing but the stars, moonlight, and distant city lights keeping you company, it was very peaceful. After sitting on the bench and talking for roughly 20 minutes, a homeless man approached us and asked if we had any smokes. We told him we had none, and he sort of just stands there for about 15 to 20 seconds. He leaves eventually, and we assumed that would be the end of it. We then got back to talking about baseball or something when once again we can hear footsteps on the gravel. We look to our left and we can see three men. One of them was the same guy that asked us if we had the smokes. Hey guys, what's up? Nice evening for a walk, am I right? I say with a friendly yet nervous tone. One of the guys tells us to hand over our phones and wallets and Jason and I just took a look at them and we start to laugh. You guys are joking, right? Our laughter goes silent when one of them flicks open a knife and says they were serious. Jason and I froze in unison, but this only lasts for a few seconds, as we both come up with the same idea. Both nodding at each other, we book it, using the momentum of the downward hill to get as much distance between these strangers and ourselves. However, they too do the same. We're now barreling down this dirt path heading toward my vehicle, being chased by three complete maniacs. I yelled to Jason to get ready to jump into the car as I pressed the button on my keys and were just moments away from our escape. Jason quickly opens the passenger side door and I do a quick 180 dive on the hood of the vehicle as Jason pushes open the driver's door for me. 
As soon as I take a seat, the three men reach the vehicle and then try opening his door. Thank goodness, however, Jason had locked it. We left the three quite literally in the dust and drove all the way back to Jason's house. Once our adrenaline had settled and our hearts were back to their normal pace, we called the police and explained we were almost mugged near that side of town. They told us they would send a few officers to search and they would call back if they needed any more information. However, I never did get a call back and I'm not sure whether or not those three were apprehended. Word of advice, avoid hanging out at lonely quiet parks. Even if you are in a safe neighborhood, you just never know who might be waiting, watching, and ready to attack. Crazy neighbor thought we were burglars. If anyone has had a similar story in their life, I would really like to hear it. Although I sit here and have a good laugh with my friend and her family, it was no laughing matter when it occurred. It was so frightening, so awful. I genuinely felt that was going to be it for me. Let me rewind to 2014, Christmas break. I was going to visit a friend who lived in rural Pennsylvania for the holiday season. In total, I visited for 11 days. We did the usual. We opened presents on Christmas, I joined them as we went to their family parties, and we stayed up way past midnight on New Year's to welcome in the year with some very delicious champagne. That was just a highlight of some of the good stuff. Now, I forget exactly which day it was, but I know it was two or three days before I was heading back home as I was beginning to slowly pack my things in my suitcase. It was about 10 p.m., and me, my friend Jessie, and her mom and dad were in the living room watching Two and a Half Men while eating some leftover pie my friend's mom had baked. Their dog, a Labrador mix, started to whine and was scratching at the living room door, indicating he needed to go out. None of us wanted to be out there since it was raining pretty heavily, and it was around 40 degrees. After much convincing, Jesse and I take the role of letting Rex, the Labrador, out for a potty break. I go into the guest bedroom I was staying in, put on my hoodie and boots, and then join Jesse at the front door. Rex wasted not a single second heading to his favorite tree to do his business as Jesse and I stood there saying, Rex, could you hurry it up? Anyways, we're back inside and we've changed and we're drinking some hot chocolate to warm back up. When Jesse's mom says, Muffin? Where's Muffin? Has anyone seen Muffin? Muffin is the name of their two-year-old cat. No, mom. Wasn't she laying down on her little bed? Jesse responds back as her mother begins to grow concerned. We ask Jesse's dad, who by this point had gone to his room, but he also says he hasn't seen her. She must have snuck out when we opened the door. Ah, oh, that cat, I swear, she's so sneaky, Jesse says, as we tell her mother and father we would go looking for her. As a reminder, it's still raining and it's still freezing, which would make our search that much more annoying. Our first idea was to check underneath the patio, as she often lay there, but it's empty. We then searched around the outside furniture, but nothing there either. Jesse then curses under her breath and says it was most likely possible Muffin went over to the neighbor's house as they love her and they'll give her treats anytime she's in the area. Well, to get to the neighbor's home you have to climb over a small fence and then you have to go past some large trees. From that point there is a huge lawn and then the house at the far end of said lawn. Jesse and I rushed over there, drenched from the downpour and we begin calling out to Muffin albeit trying to make as little noise as possible. We didn't want to wake up Jesse's neighbors. Jesse went to check the front patio as I went into the back to check underneath a couple of parked vehicles. Bingo. Muffin located. Cold, scared, and wet. Jesse, I found her. She's over here. I shouted in excitement, not realizing I'd just woken up a sleeping giant. Jesse races over to me, almost tripping over a bush. And in those moments, we hear a door opening. Who's out there? Show me your hands, a deep and disgruntled voice says. Jesse and I turned around and were face to face with a man in a shotgun pointed in our direction. That man, by the way, is the neighbor. Now, I can't even begin to explain how scary that moment was. A feeling of dread, doom, thinking that if we said the wrong thing or even tried moving, that would be it. Jesse tried to speak up and explain who we were, but the neighbor told her to be quiet and then said to come closer. 
At that point, Muffin is still under the car and we're beginning to approach this neighbor. Luckily, things then take a turn for the better. When we reach the porch light, the man immediately holsters the shotgun. And then he says, Jesse, is that you? What are you doing out here? A sense of relief came over my body as my heart began to return to its normal beating pattern and I could feel my muscles begin to relax. I'm so sorry, but Muffin got out and we found her under your car. We didn't mean to bother you. The neighbor apologized profusely before explaining he was at such a heightened tension because some no-good troublemakers had shown up to his home a few days ago and stole some expensive tools he kept in his garage. Guess the man was pretty fed up. At any rate, we grabbed Muffin and we walked back to Jesse's house, tired, cold, wet, and shook, as the cool kids say these days. To my surprise, Jesse and her family laughed off the entire incident, but I wasn't laughing. I genuinely raised the concern that someone should call the cops on him, but after much thinking, they were able to convince me otherwise. Like I said at the beginning, I've had many years to think about that incident, and yes, I laugh about it as well. I know that wasn't your typical scary story with a creepy person, but I figured I would share it with you all nonetheless. A good eye saved us from a potential mugging. This was in 2007, when my wife and I went on a road trip to celebrate our wedding anniversary. We began our adventure from Ohio and drove west heading toward Vegas. We stayed at the Monte Carlo for a week, enjoying the warm sun, pools, and all-you-can-eat buffets. Once that fun and festivity was over, we drove to Arizona where we visited the Grand Canyon. What a natural beauty that place is. After two days of sightseeing and backpacking, we packed up our things and began the long haul back to Ohio. Now anyone who travels through middle America knows just how boring and desolate it can become. You're surrounded by nothing but farm fields and roads for what seems like an eternity. To be honest, if you're not careful, it's pretty easy to fall asleep. That's why my wife was a big help with this very creepy encounter. So we had just stopped at a gas station somewhere in Missouri so I could pick up a cup of coffee and take a break from driving. And then we were once again on the road. It was now around 8 p.m. The sun had almost set and we're enjoying a nice peaceful drive while listening to some CDs my wife had brought along with her. Hey, is that someone at the side of the road? My wife pointed out to me as I end up passing someone who had their thumb out. I think we should stop. I think they might need her help. I agreed with my wife. Therefore, I turned the vehicle back and we decided to go look for them. I drove slowly, this time keeping a lookout for this individual, and soon I saw a woman who immediately waved me down. Thanks for stopping. My car broke down just a little ways back. Do you mind helping me with getting back to town? The woman expressed in a somewhat paranoid tone. To give you a description of her, from what my wife and I remember, she was a woman who looked to be in her early 30s. She had dreadlocks, a red sweater with blue jeans, and sandals for shoes. She really reminded me of a friend that I grew up with. We could go ahead and call a tow truck for you. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to assist. In the meantime, we'll keep you company, I tell her, as I soon turned the engine off. The woman then looked back into the trees that were behind her, then back at me. And then says, No, no, please, don't call anyone. C can you just come out here and help me grab my suitcase? I have it laying next to the trees. When she said that, alarm bells immediately started to ring in her head. Why was she so hesitant about calling us for help? I mean, if someone was willing to stay with me and call for a towing company, I would be more than grateful for their assistance. Not only that... But my wife and I don't recall ever seeing a vehicle parked at the side of the road. I did mention the sun was setting, but that didn't mean it was dark yet, so we could see stuff. Well, I once again asked her about her vehicle, and she's still claiming it was further down the highway. My wife and I looked at each other, with my wife's head facing away from the woman, and as we're conversing, I see the woman continue to peek back into the trees. The woman raises her arm just a tad bit, almost as if she was waving at something or someone. I made a motion for my wife to turn back at the woman, and when she does, she claims she saw movement behind some trees. Since I was sitting further away from the passenger side window, I couldn't really tell. My wife ended up reaching into the glove compartment, and she took out the flashlight I keep in there. 
She then rolled down the window just a hair, turned the flashlight on, and pointed it toward the trees. I took a look, scooting myself closer to my wife, and we saw what looked to be like three people in hoodies running further into the woods. Before we could turn to look back at the woman, she immediately booked it into the trees and disappeared into the darkness herself. My wife and I sat there, completely at a loss of words. Were those three people in the hoodies and the woman connected? We weren't sure, but it seemed that way. We drove out of there and ended up stopping at another gas station about 20 miles later, where my wife needed to use the restroom. As I waited for her grabbing some Cheetos and a Sprite, I overheard a couple of truck drivers mention seeing a woman at the side of the road. I went up to them and asked them if they were referring to a woman matching my description, and they were able to confirm my details. You gotta be very careful with who you stop for around these parts. There are a lot of people who will try to stop you at the side of the road, and they'll convince you to step out of your vehicle. From there, they'll try to mug you with a team that's waiting and hiding. The truck driver more or less explained to me. That wasn't word per word, but it's the best of what I remember. Anyways, I can't say for sure whether or not the woman we saw that evening was actually up to no good. All the details match, but as we never drove around that area again, and it was so desolate, we can't be certain. My best advice, if you see someone at the side of the road, it's okay to stop. Keep your doors and windows secure. Ask them if they need help and if you can call 911 for them. If they refuse or you see them begin to act suspiciously, that might be your sign to leave. But then again, it's your call.